Good morning and welcome to the July 19th, 2017 Board of County Commissioners meeting. I'm Kate Flavin, Public Information Officer for Sedgwick County. Commissioners, I have a few announcements this morning, so bear with me. Um, tonight, we Interest Bank Arena will host Paul McCartney and his world tour. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. The new security policy will be in place at the arena. And remember that entrance C, the north entrance, is currently under construction, but it will be open to handle guests coming to the event tonight. On Saturday and Sunday, be sure to head on over to Exploration Place for the Mini Maker Fair. And this, is, more information will be available at exploration.org. Commissioners, our first budget hearing for the 2018 recommended budget is this morning. We will also have a social media town hall on the budget, and that will be on Tuesday, July 25th at 2 p.m. So follow us along on social media. And our third, or excuse me, our second public hearing for the budget will be Monday, July 31st at 6 p.m. here on the third floor of the county courthouse, 525 North Main. And if you're not able to attend or take part in any of those public hearings, we do have our online forum available. It's on our homepage of the website. That's found at sedgwickcounty.org. And those are my announcements this morning, Chairman. So I will hand the meeting over to you. Well, thank you, Kate. And I appreciate the announcements about uh, the various ways that our citizens can become involved and, and express their opinion about the 2018 budget. So thank you for that. Yes. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the boardroom today. We, we do have a potential, at least, for an interesting meeting today with a public hearing. So uh, with that, I will call the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners to order uh, July 19th, 2017. Madam Clerk, first item. Invocation, a moment of silence. Please remain standing for the flag salute. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, first item. Roll call. Commissioner Dennis. Present. Commissioner Ranzaw. Present. Commissioner Howell. Present. Commissioner O'Donnell. Present. Chairman Unruh. Present. And next item, please. Public agenda. Uh, commissioners, I haven't had anyone uh, sign up to speak on uh, specific issues this morning before our meeting, so we will continue and ask for the next item. Appointments. Item A, accept the resignation from Bill Fathlick in the education position of the Sedgwick County Juvenile Corrections Advisory Board. Mr. Chairman, Eric Yost, uh, County Counselor, uh, item A is uh, a resolution to accept the resignation of Mr. Faflick from the uh, education position of the Juvenile Advisory Board. Mr. Faflick is uh, moving out of the community. Uh, he was an at-large appointee and his term would have expired uh, June 30th of 2018, uh, so he will need to be replaced for that. Um, and I would urge adoption of this resolution. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, What's the will of the board? I move that we accept the resignation. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dennis. Just a, a couple comments. Uh, I've known uh, Bill Fafflick for uh, a lot of years. Uh, he was the athletic director when I first met him of USD 259 uh, when I was working over at North High School, and I was the announcer for North High School at that time before I moved over to Northwest to announce for them. I served on uh, the Kansas State High School Activities Association Executive Board of Directors uh, with uh, Bill. Uh, I worked with him uh, as he was Assistant Superintendent for USD 259. He's going to be sorely missed uh, in our community. Uh, I just want to pass on my congratulations in his new job as uh, the Director of Kansas State High School Activities Association up in Topeka. Uh, so I, I'm sure I'll still be able to work with him, uh, but uh, I just wanted to tell everyone how much I appreciated working with him over the years and how much he contributed to the youth in the Wichita. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and uh, I would second those comments. I um, had the privilege of worshiping with Bill uh, for several years at, at our home church, and uh, he is um, a great community citizen. He will be missed. Um, seeing no more comment, Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. 
Commissioner Ranzaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. And next item. New business, item B. Public hearing regarding the 2018 Sedgwick County budget. Commissioners, Mike Scholes, County Manager. It's uh, great to be here today. Today being the first public uh, hearing for the 2018 uh, budget. Uh, the publication filed with you last week was a total budget of $407,276,187 and an ad valorem property tax levy of $137,441,377, which is approximately equivalent to 29.359 mills, based on an, the estimated assessed valuation and subject to te technical adjustments. With that, commissioners, we can start the public hearing. All right, thank you. Commissioners, are there any questions of the manager before we uh, begin the public hearing? I see none, so um, at this time I will open the public hearing and ask if there's anyone here who wishes to speak on the budget. So if you step to the podium and state your name and you have three minutes. Lonnie Wright, 1721 South Lulu in Wichita. And I want to compliment both the budget and the process. You know, last year when our new county manager presented his budget, I recall that he was a commander of a war zone. So I was preparing myself for some slash and burn, maybe even some blood on the floor. <laughs> but instead, I got the opposite. You know, he raised some salaries for employees added some uh, safety uh, personnel, didn't cut services, and had a surplus. I mean, it was almost like magic. I think he's done the same thing again with this budget. You know, he's recognized employees, added public safety, had another surplus, but again, uh, uh, this time he's been able to add some services. So as far as I'm concerned, he's Magic Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to pre tell the commission how much I appreciate uh, the transparency and openness of the budget process. It makes it so much easier for us to understand um, how the county and the departments uh, work. I'm referring to your public hearings. Where instead of the departments just dealing with the manager, they deal directly with you and they summarize uh, what they're doing and the challenges and is open to the public. <clears throat> Secondly, reading the budget online is um, easy. Instead of having to scroll <laughs> down a bunch of pages through the hundreds of pages looking at numbers, you can just click on each item and go back and forth. So I want to say I'm uh, pleased with both Magic Mike and the process, and thank you for your transparency. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wright. Appreciate that. Um, those very, very kind words. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak regarding uh, the budget for 2018? I see no one rising to speak. And I don't recognize someone that I <coughs> from the public. So <clears throat> that being the case, we won't linger here. No one, no one wishing to speak. So therefore, we will close the public hearing. And commissioners, do you have any comments um, before we move on? All right. This doesn't take any action from the board. So we will um, just close the public hearing and uh, announce once more that our next opportunity for citizens to weigh in at a public hearing is um, in the evening of July 31st is that is that correct all right thank you and then uh, social media uh, interaction um, is on what day did Kate say that was July 25 okay July 20 I don't know much about social media that's one reason I'm stumbling but we can go online for that form at any time on our website okay that being the case commissioners we will move on to the next item of business uh, madam Kirk, clerk please call the next item item c discussion of emergency ambulance services agreement 
Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, um, I'm not Magic Mike, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, I am Eric Yost, County Counselor, and I, uh, item C is the uh, proposed agreement between the county and the City of Wichita related to EMS services. Uh, just by way of background, um, the City did take this matter up yesterday. They did approve it. They did modify it also. And what I'm uh, asking to be handed out is the new uh, language uh, that they have approved. Um, Sedgwick County, of course, has been the uh, exclusive, <coughs> exclusive provider of emergent medical ambulance service in Sedgwick County since 1975 and the exclusive provider of non-emergent services since 1985. Uh, and we are currently operating under a, an agreement from 2003 uh, which was a five-year agreement with automatic renewals every year and has been uh, renewed every year. Um, but during this last year, we have been uh, discussing with the city certain changes we would want to make to that agreement. Uh, those negotiations have resulted in what you have in front of you today. Uh, many of, of those discussions have been conducted by members of our commission and members of the city council uh, and, and um, with some help from council in drafting the language. Uh, I think everyone is in agreement that the emergency side of these medical services, the ambulance services, uh, has been exemplary. Uh, no one has uh, been stated any unhappiness with that. I think uh, it's actually a model for the whole state and nation uh, how we handle emergency ambulance services. Uh, we've been talking about the non-emergent services and in in the agreement that you have in front of you, paragraphs 6 and 10 uh, relate to all of that. Uh, paragraph 6, um, as, it is, as it is in front of you today, uh, states that, there, that our goal is to have a non-emergent response time of uh, one hour or less 100% of the time. Uh, but that we know we have to hold, be held, actually held to a certain standard um, uh, and be required to uh, meet that standard and so that standard is one hour or less response time 98 percent of the time uh, and that's what has been written in the language it is um, up to the county how to achieve that they can do that we can do that by either enhancing our capabilities uh, meaning added personnel added ambulances stations uh, or we can contract with um, third-party providers if we wish to do that and that is our uh, at our sole option and discretion um, if the county chooses uh, to go to have um, third party uh, they can control that process entirely uh, according to this language uh, and it also states that the private um, providers must meet the same standard that we meet as far as response time uh, uh, the county has also agreed uh, that it will make uh, best efforts to secure a list of vendors. Um, the city understands that that may not be possible. There may, there may be a lack of interest or people may not be qualified because they do have to meet certain qualifications. And if you look at the agreement you have in front of you in paragraph um, 6 on page 3, you have certain standards. I won't read through them all, but it's pretty rigorous and it's possible people, a lot of people won't uh, meet those qualifications. Um, so if, uh, and we have language in the agreement that you have in front of you that says that if, if, there, uh, if no one qualifies or if no one uh, has an interest in doing this, that does not constitute a breach of contract by us. Uh, if EMS uh, fails to meet the standard of one hour or less 98% of the time uh, for two consecutive quarters, uh, a rehabilitation plan must be uh, prepared by EMS and provided to the city uh, and then they will have two additional quarters to try to implement that plan. Again, it's our sole option and discretion as to whether or not to enhance our own capabilities with that or to use third-party providers. Uh, if at the end of those four quarters the standard still has been, has not been, we have not been brought into compliance by that, um, the city uh, has the option under this agreement uh, to provide written notice of termination. Um, uh, the notice would have to be for at least 180 days out, uh, but they have the right to terminate 
the agreement under those circumstances. Uh, we have agreed to compile a list of those qualified uh, uh, providers, as I stated, uh, to the extent that we can do so and to the extent that they are uh, qualified. Uh, the new language, though, and I, and I would direct your attention to that on page four, the yellow highlight that we've distributed to you, uh, their new language states that uh, if, if we know that when someone calls us and uh, we're not going to be able to be there within an hour, uh, that we must call off that list uh, and, and provide them with that transport. Uh, that's the new language that the city uh, council adopted yesterday. Uh, and uh, we have also uh, some reference in, in paragraph 10 that says that uh, in doing all this and helping to implement this program that um, we have we provide uh, reports to the city we will provide reports on a quarterly basis but if, if we ever fall below the standard of 98 percent at any given month we then have to report mon monthly until that uh, has been rectified <coughs> Uh, this is an agreement uh, for an initial term of five years with automatic renewals of three one-year terms. Uh, so the most, uh, the longest this can go under the current language is eight years. Uh, either party can choose to not renew after the first five years by simply giving notice by July 1st of that given year. Um, this is a little bit different than the 2003 agreement um, in that the 2003 agreement was something that could be renewed annually without any action by any party uh, in perpetuity. Uh, they can give notice to quit uh, by July 1 of any year, but it, was, it would have gone on as long as anybody wanted to. This does not. This, is an, this has an eight-year limit. And so with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. I know that Mr. Hadley's here um, for any technical questions re related to EMS. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Yost. We appreciate that. Uh synopsis of this contract and um, commissioners are there any questions or comments if there are questions or comments now is the time what is the will of the board I don't know the to whom? Public. Um, I will allow public comment but I'd like to see if there's any commission comment first and I don't see any but uh, we can um, um, we can go ahead if you'd like to have public comment now. That's fine with me. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak on this issue? I see no one rising to speak, so Commissioner Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've got a number of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm not a lifelong politician, so everything I'm going to say is probably not politically correct, okay? Uh, first, though, uh, I do want to thank a number of people. Uh, our uh, county manager, Mike Scholes, and his staff uh, were fantastic. Uh, uh, Tom Stoltz gave me advice that uh, was uh, uh, unmatched. Uh, Scott Hadley and his folks, uh, and especially his EMS folks, that really are the ones that we're doing all this for. Uh, we're very proud of them. We're very proud of the record that they've had. Uh, and the people that we're really fighting for and is not only our EMS folks, but all of the citizens here in Sedgwick County. And all of those citizens in Sedgwick County are our are in, in Wichita are our citizens of Sedgwick County. So uh, we care very deeply about each one of those folks. Some other folks that uh, were deeply involved in this is Eric Yost and his staff, especially uh, Misha, who's uh, left uh, Karen who's worked it after Amisha's departure so I want to give credit to each one of those folks that were involved in in what happened here this process uh, stretched over a number of months actually uh, during that number of months uh, uh, I'm not certain that the city of Wichita negotiated uh, in good faith uh, as we moved forward uh, they moved the bar every time that we had uh, a new contract supposedly put together. My folder here is all of the different versions of contracts that we put together over those months. Every time we sent something across and we thought we had an agreement, uh, we found out we didn't have an agreement. 
We went across the street uh, and uh, City Manager Layton said that we were going to have a contract, so we went over there uh, and, and a group of us went over to, to watch them vote on it, uh, only to find out that they weren't going to vote on it. We then had an en banc, well actually in between, we had uh, uh, another uh, side meeting with uh, some of uh, the folks that had been negotiating, and then we had an en banc meeting. And I think that meeting uh, was kind of enlightening to some extent in the fact that it appeared to me that all of our co discussions weren't entirely about the CMS contract. I think there was an underlying uh, distrust from the city of Wichita with the county commission. What they haven't done is haven't opened their blinds lately and recognized that there is a different county commission sitting over here than there had been in the past. But I think they're still trying to basically poke a stick in the eye of a uh, county commission at times. Uh, they were making sausage yesterday when the, they decided from the bench to add seven new words to the contract. They had that existing contract that we gave them about a week and a half to two weeks ago, and not once in that week and a half to two weeks did we hear a single word that there was a problem with that contract. A number of us went out to watch the change of command ceremony instead of going over to the city council meeting yesterday because we were assured once again, and uh, the words were directly, you've got 7-0, it's going to be voted 7-0. That was direct words that we received on what th this was going to be. So I didn't have any worry about not going to the meeting yesterday and not speaking because I was under the impression that it was going to be 7-0. But what we found out was even at the en banc when things that had happened at this commission prior to, to this, at the previous commission, prior to this uh, body that as it's meeting today, uh, they are still holding a grudge on it. They even mention it at the en banc. So if that's in true, truly the way that they feel, uh, I think that they need to start worrying just as I do about our citizens. Truly yesterday when I saw these seven words, uh, and it is a material change to the uh, contract. Uh, I was at the point where that I was going to delay this contract so that we could go back and see if we could negotiate again. Uh, some cooler heads actually came and spoke to me, uh, several of them, uh, and reminded me once again of my own words uh, that we're doing this for the citizens and we're not doing it for us. And, and if I'm going to delay it, then I'm guilty of exactly what I'm um, blaming the county or the city uh, council of doing is holding a grudge, and I'm certainly not doing that. Uh, I've promised when I ran that I was going to be a good partner, and that's what I've tried to be all along. Uh, I'm not sure that all seven members over there are trying to be good partners. Uh, and one thing I totally don't understand is how that one member over there even though we promised 100%, can still say that it's not good enough and votes every time no. So bottom line, uh, I'm going to make a motion that uh, we adopt uh, the contract uh, of the ambulance uh, service <coughs> as written, uh, as amended by the city council, uh, because I think it's the best thing for the citizens in Sedgwick County, especially the citizens in Wichita. Uh, we've got a huge investment. We've got like $30 million investment just in infrastructure and, and people. We spend $16 million a year just in the city of Wichita on uh, what it costs us uh, for salaries for the people that are serving our citizens in Wichita. Uh, we can't jeopardize uh, uh, an investment that large. We can't jeopardize the health and welfare of the citizens in the city of Wichita. So that's why I make my motion. Uh, and again, I'm sorry if I'm not politically correct but I was not pleased uh, with uh, the fact that we did not know until we were sitting out there at the uh, change of command ceremony and received a text that there was any question whatsoever on what we sent over two weeks ago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. So we have a motion to second. approve the contract, and we have a second. Uh, is there further discussion from the commissioners? Commissioner Hatton. <coughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the... Uh previous speaker's comments. Uh, I, I have some questions about a couple of the aspects of the contract I'd like to ask for, for some clarity. Um, by reading the contract, um, looks to me like uh, if we 
I believe we're not going to make the call within uh, 60 minutes, that we're the ones that have to make the call to the third party. Is that correct? In other words, Sedgwick County has to make the call to the third party. Go ahead. Uh, Commissioner Health Scott Hadley, EMS, that is correct, that we would make that decision on whether to call that third party. That would be EMS's call. Okay. And again, how many of these, can you please remind, please remind me, I guess in 20, 20, uh, 16, how many times do we have, um, did we not make our 60 minute threshold? I don't recall 2016 off the top of my head, but 2017 for the first six months, city of Wichita, and we're excluding uh, Wesley because we have a contract with them to provide service, was 18 calls that were over an hour within the corporate city limits of Wichita, January 1st through June 30th of 2017. I'm just curious, on those 18 calls, do we know uh, maybe you can't answer this. I don't know if, if this is information that you have or not, but how many of those 18 calls do we know at the beginning of that hour that we weren't going to make it in an hour? Uh, I, I can't give you a good answer. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that on the 18 that we knew up front that we were so busy. There's no way we can make it in an hour. There may have been some. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we may have known, but others, it's not that clear because we dispatch a unit and they may get preempted to go to an emergency call and get called off that so that that happens quite frequently yeah i think I mean, that's my <clears throat> excuse me that's my understanding is we do, we do use our regular our regular vehicles our regular paramedic crew to do these non-emergency non-emergency transports and if they're the closest resource to a, an emergent issue they're going to be uh, redirected i would think correct and the that's right the way it should do. work yes and uh again, again i i don't know but um, you know if we had a uh a non-emergent crew that they simply did not provide uh, you know the same type of uh, uh, skill set perhaps they could stay focused on on meeting their meeting their uh, appointments or whatever but uh, to the extent we've got a, an emergency crew that's doing this type of work the, they do get redirected and so um, it does make sense to me that that's, that's probably out of those 18 I'm going to guess at least at least a, lo a good majority of them probably are are of that uh, of that type that they got redirected um, so let me ask a question so let's say we are um, planning to be somewhere to, to do a non emergency transport let's say we will plan to be there within the hour let's say about 40 minutes into that call we get redirected at that point we call the third party is that what we have to do, do yes, they have we, an hour at that point for them to, to respond they would have to meet the same requirements that we are granted we're 40 minutes into it but the, the they're goal not going to be there in 20 minutes. So correct. They have another whole hour. Correct. So, so theoretically, this could be a two-hour wait by even using third party. We could be, it, we have up to an hour. It could. We could call third party. You know, five minutes from the end of our time limit, and then they could they have another whole hour. So yeah, they could still, be busy. They could not be available. There's a, a variety of things that could occur for us not to be there within that hour. This way, this contract is written. We absolutely have to call that third party. We don't have a choice to to redeploy a different unit. We the could, way this is written, it says we, according to that paragraph that was edited yesterday, it says we must call from the list of third-party providers. If we know we're not going to be there in an hour, and again, we don't always know, and it could be at shift change. We could hold a unit over to have them make the call and not call the third party. There, there are flexibility and options. That let me ask the question differently. That. Okay, so let's say 45 minutes into this call, this, this ambulance gets redirected to an emergency ish, ish situation. We know we're not going to make that in 60 minutes. Correct. As required. Correct. The way this is written, we have the only option we have at that point is to call a third party. Even if we have another resource that can get there in 25 minutes, it doesn't matter. We have to call from this third, third party list, and they have a full hour get there you see my point in other words if we're into that hour a significant amount of time correct and we find out we're not going to make it we have to call off this third party list and they have a full hour to respond even if we have other resources that could have made it there may be the reason that, that that we're not going to make the hours because the closest resource to an actual emergency was they were planning to do this non-emergency transport but they got redirected and say that was 45 minutes into a 60 minute call right a 60 minute response time now we got 15 minutes and we know we're not going to make it in 15 minutes the next Correct. resource is 20 minutes away what this says is now we have to call from a third party list yes and they have a full hour to respond am i correct in saying it that way that's what this says yes that's what and i believe this says they would have an hour to respond right. let me ask a couple of other questions um if this if we did not adopt this today and i perceive based on colleague, my, my colleagues' comments already, I'm, I'm sure this is probably going to pass, but this, assume for just a minute this did not pass. 
what would be the next step? We we would not have a contract. They would they would assume, presumably Wichita would, would notify us. We, they're not going to renew the contract. We would start then negotiations on a new contract. I would assume they could. Is that what happened? They could give notice. They have till the end of the month to provide that letter of notice that they didn't want to renew it. They could yeah. renegotiate that between now and then. There's a variety of things that could occur should you not approve it today. But if we did not approve it, then again, it doesn't doesn't mean we don't have EMS services in Sedgwick County. Correct. It means we have got to continue our discussions with right. the city. Which our current contract, contract carries us through the end of the year. We've essentially gone through the process as if, as if they've given us notice. We've, we've renegotiated a contract in good faith as if we've already received notice, so to speak, that the old contract wasn't going wasn't to be acceptable to them. So we've been doing that process all along. To me, this is a little bit arbitrary whether this is adopted today because we've been negotiating for how many months has it been going on now? Several months at least. Yes. In fact, I would say since last year, uh, we've, been, we've been talking about this contract. Mm -hmm. and so. If this was not adopted today, it doesn't mean we don't have EMS services in Sedgwick County. It means the conversation would continue. Correct. Uh, I, I listened to the meeting yesterday, although I did go to the change of command ceremony with Commissioner Dennis. Uh, I did listen to that meeting intently. I listened to all the comments of the city council members, and it was obvious to me that uh, many of the members were, well, at least one of the members was very interested in just providing freedom of choice mm -hmm. to, uh, to his constituents. And said, uh, I believe that, that was the, uh, the compelling reason why he voted no. He doesn't think we need to manage this part of it. And I, I again, I, I walked into the meeting, to, meeting today literally on the fence. I, I see arguments to vote yes, and I see arguments to vote no. And on, on the side of voting no, I think I understand the arguments of, of, of Councilmember Clendenin that he wants to provide choice to the people that he serves. And I think that's a commendable position to take. You know, free, we, we talk about free market, we talk about choice. And uh, it could be, you know, I don't, what do we charge typically for a non-emergency transport with someone with the ability to pay? What would that charge be? Our, our current charge for that level for a non-emergent basic life support is $350 plus $13 a mile. Okay, so someone's going to probably pay around 400 bucks, let's just say. And uh, it could be the, non, the uh, third party might be half that. We don't know. So once again, if there's no emergency, you know, allowing the, the people to shop around and get a, uh, something they can potentially more afford, that might be something that we ought to allow them to do that. Uh, on the other side of the equation, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, upsetting our revenue stream because I think we've got a very uh, good balance of EMS services that depends on revenue for it to fully operate, and I am concerned about upsetting that balance. And so, you know, if we're only talking about 18 uh, ambulance uh, rides in 2017, I don't think this is, that's not a significant amount. I don't know what that calculates out to, but to say all 18 of those chose a third party uh, provider, it's not going to substantially upset our balance uh, of uh, our EMS services otherwise. Do you see my point? Does that make sure. sense? Am I, mis am, I, am, I, am I misunderstanding something here? No. Okay. Um, so I guess I, I see that my concern about the revenue stream is maybe, maybe a little overstated. I don't, I'm not sure I have a concern at that, uh, about that so much because it's not a substantial number of people who would have that option. I don't know um, if if they do, if they did choose to terminate the, the agreement again either if we did not adopt this today and they wanted to uh, terminate that the content the conversation would continue but it, within this agreement if they choose to uh, they say we don't make 98 percent two quarters they have the option to terminate the contract at that point no they give we, us notice excuse me they have give us notice that they, no after I mean, I, I after support. two quarters if we don't meet 98 percent we have to provide them a rehabilitation plan okay. to address that then we have two additional quarters to come back in compliance okay i i remember that's correct but then but then that could be any time of the year that that would happen it could be any quarter of the year that we would come to that fourth quarter that could happen in march or or june or uh, September. yeah it had to be Whichever. two consecutive quarters that we fall below that mark so that could happen basically when we're far away from a budget cycle potentially. Yes. That's another concern, I guess. Again, this I think this is intended to create a new contract starting January the first. Correct. For a calendar year. But we potentially might end up having might have it to adjust our, our contract with the city that would start sometime that would not be matched up with the calendar year. Otherwise we might have to start a new contract potentially in in March, uh, when we didn't have a, a budget cycle to adjust our our uh, revenue expectations, so to speak, because it's no longer tied to a calendar year. It could happen any any quarter. We might be into the situation where we have to we'd have to renegotiate a new contract. 
well, I don't know and if adopt we, a new contract. I don't know that we have to renegotiate it, but we have, if we fall below that 98% for two consecutive quarters, we have a remediation plan in place, and then we have two more quarters to have corrective <clears throat> action and get above 98%. Once that happens, we don't have to renegotiate anything. Okay, but get to that fourth quarter. If, there's, if we haven't met our 98% and the city wishes to do uh, go forward, do they terminate? Could they give us notice at that point to terminate? They could give us 180 days notice if we fail in the in the remediation period. They could give notice. Doesn't mean they will. Is that the end of that 180 days could be any time in the calendar year. Any, any it could be it, it, yes. virtually any quarter. Okay. My point is it gets us out of a calendar year cycle potentially. Right. So I just want to make that point. Okay. okay. Let's see, I had I think one other question. And if, and again, if I would brush rather, I guess if if we were no, if we know we're not going to make the, uh, the the hour, I guess I'd prefer it if we would let the uh, the person that needs the service know that, let them call from that list. I think I would be preferable to me. I don't know that I want to be responsible to make that call on their behalf. What happens if the third party is busy and and now it's assumed that they're going to be there within one hour, but they only have limited resources in the county as well. Let's say they're busy. What happens then if they if they can't make the hour? They don't think they can make it in one hour. Then what happens? Then we make it as soon as we can. We we won't be there. No one will be there within the hour. And we let the patient know that that it's going to be longer for them. They're going to have to wait longer. Well, I'll tell you. I I have a number of concerns about this contract. I uh, the words that they added yesterday, in my opinion, are are concerning for one reason. That is that. Uh, I think the county has done a tremendous job of getting this number to 98 percent, and actually we have exceeded 98 percent, and we're committing in this contract to stay there above 98 percent. To me, that's a huge commitment, and I, I appreciate our EMS personnel. They do a tremendous job. You do a tremendous job. It's taken a lot of investment on Central County by taxpayers to get us to this high level of service. It's a very high standard. And it's not perfect, but nothing in gov not, nothing by anybody is perfect. Uh, you know, I think to, to have a government agencies operating at 98 percent is, is a, just a, a tremendous um, high standard for us to uh, benchmark ourselves and so I'm extremely impressed with with what we're currently doing but uh, one thing that bothers me about this is is in the words that were added yesterday in my opinion it actually puts us in a corner I don't I have a concern about whether or not that makes <clears throat> that makes sense maybe the next provider is 20 minutes away, but we don't have the option to call them. I think that well, this is intending to this is intending to d resolve how we would uh, manage this issue, but I think it falls short. It doesn't actually give us all the options that it should, and I think it really ought to be up to the Sedgwick County uh, uh, Service Management, uh, it would be the director or the manager or others that have uh, input into our system. It ought to be up to them to determine the best ways to, to resolve those kinds of things when they happen. Let us manage the system. Uh, again, I think if we're going to manage the system, we ought to be allowed to manage the system. But this, the words they added yesterday puts us in the corner. And I think that, that it, it attempts to solve a problem, but I think it actually limits our, our options. And it actually is trying to tell us exactly how they think that ought, that ought to be solved. In reality, I, I think that it falls short because it limits what we can do to solve the problem. So I guess I, I have some concerns about that. I would say I, I appreciate the, uh, the negotiations. I know that uh, our chairman and pro tem and I think uh, Commissioner Dennis have spent uh, a lot of their time meeting with people at the city, uh, negotiating uh, ideas. Uh, and I agree with Commissioner Dennis. There's been a, a series of uh, proposals, um, one after the other, and uh, I felt that uh, uh, the, the last uh, contract that was given to them was 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 fairly good and, and people I thought uh, were, were, were agreeable to that but with changes they made yesterday it makes me feel less I, I don't agree with this as much as I did before <clears throat> but I do appreciate those that uh, negotiated I appreciate our friends across the street I know they want the best for their citizens as I think we do as well but I think what's best for the citizens is is uh, maybe the previous contract and so I guess right now I'm gonna probably gonna not support going forward I think that uh, the small delay would be much more appropriate we just got this language yesterday we haven't even had time to talk about this in any way we received the language and uh, uh, my opinion this is just uh, very very late change and it has a major significance to what we do here so I guess I would pre I would be much more uh, 
willing to support the contract potentially in a week, but I think delaying this one week would be much more reasonable. I'm not going to make a substitute motion. I think I've already heard the three commissioners want to move forward. That's fine. I would be willing to support this potentially once we have some time to talk about some of these some of these details. But right now, as it sits, I'm not going to support it. So um, I got, again, I want to say I appreciate you, Director Hadley. I appreciate Thank our EMS personnel. I think we've got one of the best systems in the nation. I think we are uh, we're doing things very, very well. And to be critical of that system and not let us manage this at that high standard, I think, is just a mistake. So I think that this contract falls short. And for that reason, I'm not going to support it this morning. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Ransall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think as far as commissioners are concerned, I've probably been the most uh, sympathetic to the city's uh, concerns. Um, as such, I, I continue to have problems or concerns with this contract as well, albeit somewhat differently than my colleagues. I'm actually okay with the language language that was inserted. Um, and I've got, like I said, I have several issues with this contract, but I'm, for brevity's sake, I'm only going to mention two. First of all, I think as a result of this protracted negotiations, and paragraph six has become very convoluted, confusing, you might even say contradictory. Um, and if we ever had a dispute over this, it would be a mess, I think, trying to iron that out. I would suggest that as everything calms down, that maybe at some point we would want to go back and take a look at that and perhaps see if we can come to better wording for that whole thing. But um, And then the second thing is, um, We've been talking about calls over 60 minutes or 45 minutes. I think that was, and um, you know, I had Scott Hadley do an analysis. If we if we gave up every call over 60 minutes, that's that would cost us twelve thousand dollars in revenue. And I feel like uh, we've been spending a lot of time and effort just to protect twelve thousand dollars in revenue, while at the same time, I'm not sure we've we've done a cost benefit analysis to see if it's even worth arguing about or debating about this. I mean, as, as the response percentage of responses that goes up that have to be within an hour within a certain time frame, the amount of resources you have to put into it to achieve that goal outpace the, the, the revenue. And so there's a cost benefits that could get out of whack over time. I, I'm concerned we're maybe past that. Um, so as we move forward and we do this, and there again, as things calm down, I think we should look at this, we may find that actually by partnering with third parties after a certain time, whether it's 60 minutes, 45, 30 minutes, we actually may be able to improve services to the community while at the same time directing more of our services towards emergent and, and be, be, be able to provide service in a more cost-effective manner. I think that's a very distinct possibility. We've We've been given a monopoly, and we've kind of acted like a monopoly, and we're, we're doing everything we can to preserve that monopoly, every single call we want, but I'm not sure if we did a cost-benefit analysis, we would, we would come to the conclusion that it was actually cost-effective for the taxpayer and in everyone's best interest. That being said, um, I know there's been a lot of negotiations back and forth. I appreciate everyone involved on both sides. Uh, the city has voted to... Um, support this current agreement and I think the majority of my colleagues uh, are willing to do so as well and so with the only last caveat I, I would say is I think as far as the city is concerned they expect these six words to make a difference and I think we should exercise this contract in good faith and 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 in, in exercising paragraph six as convoluted as it is as we move forward but nevertheless those are my comments and I will be supportive thank you thank you commissioner I don't see anyone else um, asking to speak. I would just say that um, this has been an arduous process and sometimes somewhat um, frustrating, um, <clears throat> but I think that's the way it is sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, in partnerships where um, there is a lot of back and forth. Uh, I, just, I just would want to make a couple of statements here to say, I want a clarification that uh, we're talking about non-emergency medical transports. So these are folks who are not in any sort of crises. Now we find that 40% of those non-emergent calls do turn into a higher level of care. And so that's why it's important that our trained uh, EMS folks are on scene and able to provide that transport. We are not talking about those transports that are not medical, where someone may, perhaps in a wheelchair or for some other reason needs a transport. They can call one of a dozen other folks in the community who provide that level of transport. 
Um, so these are, these, are, these are medical transports, and um, we are committed to providing the highest level of care for those individuals. <clears throat> the, um, the high level of performance that uh, we impose upon ourselves and that the cities impose upon us, I think, is um, remarkable and admirable. If we provide uh, pickup within uh, one hour, 98 percent of the time, to non-emergency folks, I mean, that's pretty outstanding. I think both the city and the county should be um, talking about that in a very positive tone. That's excellent service. Now, we are going to try to make it all in 100 percent within an hour, but uh, as has been noted, it's pretty hard to be absolutely um, perfect on, on every incident that's called. But I think that this has proven itself to be um, a great partnership with the city. I think that not only do our counterparts in the city of Wichita, but Sedgwick County Commissioners speak repeatedly about functional consolidation, about ways that we consolidate to save money and provide the best services for our citizens. And this is probably um, the crown jewel example of good of good cooperation between city and county governments and between consolidation. There's only one ambulance service. It's been doing a great job for 30 years or, or whatever the length of time it's doing. We're continuing to invest more into the system. We are adding uh, crews as we see necessary. We have plans to add two more EMS posts, both in the city of Wichita. So uh, I want to point out the excellent job that's been done our commitment to continue at that high level, and, uh, and I believe our citizens on the whole are very pleased with the response that they're getting. It's reliable. We have the highest level of accreditations, um, and, I, and I think that, uh, well, I just think folks appreciate that. We will abide by the contract. We will look to try to find those other uh, carriers in the community who can provide non-emergent medical, tra medical transport at the um, somewhat the same level that we're providing. We, we want to make sure they're certified. We're not asking them to meet the highest level at which we're certified, but we, we want them to have some credentialing. So we're going we're gonna to have a good list of people, and I would want the citizens to know that we're not going to yield this service over to someone that we don't think is, uh, that we think is incapable of providing our level of service. And we will abide by the rules of the contract, and that we think we can't get them, uh, get, make that pick up at a time, we'll call people off the list. Um, I, it's, it is a little disconcerting that when we've been providing this level of service and have been investing um, at the high level we have in EMS posts and personnel and doing a great job, that there would be any criticism of us at all. I guess that's what kind of, I don't, don't figure that out. We're doing great. And I want the citizens of uh, our county to know that uh, as we go forward. Um, this is uh, said by some of my colleagues. Been a you know a, a difficult a difficult process, and I know that uh, some some members of the city council say they just want freedom of choice, and um, and and we had freedom of choice 40 years ago or whenever it was when we had different ambulance services vying for it, and one of the reasons the county took it over because it was chaos, it was a mess, it was all kinds of problems. Uh, even bordering on legal issues. So we've had a great system. We're doing well. Um, and one, one really important um, comparison, I think, in, in our research as we talk this out, is that we found out that the, uh, the city of, um, uh, or in Johnson County, I believe that um, their per capita cost of, of uh, emergency, their pre- their per capita cost of running their system is about $20 per capita in Johnson County. Ours is $5.78. We're doing a remarkable job here. <clears throat> and you know, they got more people in a smaller area. So we got fewer people, bigger area, and we're doing that. Uh, so to try to drive home the point that not only <clears throat> have we excellent service and performance, but we're doing it very, very efficiently. And so, um, my point is we're doing a great job, and even under the terms of this contract, we're going to continue to do a great job. And um, a, a little chagrin that some of our folks at the city council think they, they want to kind of tell us how to do our business, but nevertheless, 
we've got to this point. We're going to do a job, and I think I'm ready to sign off on the contract. Uh, I don't see it as um, being something that Mr. Hadley and his people can't manage in a way that still provides great service to our citizens. So with that uh, ramble, I'll ask if there's any other questions <coughs> or comments. Seeing none, we have a motion and a second, Madam Clerk, is that correct? Uh, please call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ranzaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. No. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. Mr. Hadley, thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And I uh, would also thank through this process uh, our manager and also Mr. Stoltz for their work and input in getting us to a resolution. Madam Clerk, next item. <clears throat> Item D, consideration of a grant in the amount of $2,969,873 for the Kansas Department for Aging and Disability Services Fiscal Years 2018 to 2021 Area Plan. Good morning, Commissioners. Annette Graham, Division of Aging. This is the Central Plains Area Agency on Aging Older Americans Act Area Plan. This is a new cycle, so it is for 2018 through 2021. Uh, this plan that you have before you outlines how those funds will be allocated and expended for fiscal year 2018, which begins October 1st, 2017. This is, as a Central Plains Area Agency on Aging, we serve Butler, Harvey, and Sedgwick senior citizens age 60 and older. And this is for a grant, the grant amount is $2,969,873. Under the area plan, this is an allocation. The state gets federal dollars that come down and then they're allocated to 11 area agencies on aging across the state based on an allocation formula that looks at our population, our numbers, our percentages, low income and minority. So they set this funding up in titles and that outlines how those funds can be spent. So under the administration funding we have $95,980. Under Title 3B Support and Community Services $473,736. Title 3C1 is the Congregate Nutrition and there are some additional funds in this and that's state dollars and nutrition and services incentive funds. So it's $735,627 federal, state dollars is $24,950, and the NSIP money is $58,235. Title 3C2 is the Home Delivered, also known as Meals on Wheels program, federal dollars $432,435, state dollars $697,596, and the NSIP of $161,103. Title 3D is the smallest of the programs, and that is Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, $35,938. And then Title 3E is our National Family Caregiver Support Program at $254,273. Now, this is an estimated budget. It's based on our current 2017 area plan budget. Uh, as you are aware, the federal budget has not been established yet, so we always use the previous year's, the current year's budget, and then when that allocation is announced, then we adjust the, the budget accordingly. So there is a required grant, I mean a required match of $175,619. Out of that, the Sedgwick County responsibility is $73,693. Our providers contribute to the match, as do Butler and Harvey County Departments on Aging, and they provide the remaining match. So the total sources of this grant are $3,145,492. We do have a Central Plains Aging Advisory Council. It's made up of members of all three county Department on Aging. So the members that you appoint to Sedgwick County Department on Aging Council, three of those are, appoint, are elected and, and serve on that. So that Advisory Council did review and approve this on March 29th. We have also had a public hearing where it was presented and opportunity for discussion. I have presented it to both the Butler County and the Harvey County commissioners who have reviewed it and uh, provided their approval for the Sedgwick County as the governing board to sign off on that. Um, there have been um, no major 
no really major significant changes other than one, and that was in the area of nutrition. So what we see statewide, locally, and nationally is some movement and trending that there are less utilization of the congregate nutrition sites and more of the home delivered. Um, there are less um, numbers with that. We've been seeing that for a long time, so we're able to move money between the two, and we have moved some of the funding allocation from the congregate program to the home delivered. The home delivered program serves a more uh, senior population, a more frail, and a homebound population, and we're seeing more of that as uh, nationally the fastest growing segment of the population is age 100 plus. So. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions you have on this and would request that you ap approve the area plan and authorize the chairman to sign. Thank you, Annette. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions or comment on this item? Seeing none, what's the will of the board? <coughs> Move to approve the plan, authorize the chairman to sign. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any uh, comment or question on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ranzaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. Thank you, Annette. Next item, please. Item E, consideration of a grant in the amount of $285,181 for the continuation of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, funded by the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Good morning, Commissioners, Mr. Chairman, uh, Colonel Richard Powell with the Sheriff's Office. I've brought before you this morning for your consideration a uh, grant in the amount of $285,181, which will be used for the continuation of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, this funding being provided by the United States Department of Justice, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. For the benefit of uh, those commissioners that are new to the bench this year, I thought I would um, maybe provide a little bit of historical information for you to help you make a, uh, a more informed and better decision, uh, or a decision. Um, the Sedgwick County Sheriff's Office uh, is the, is the uh, grantee at administration focal point of the Kansas Internet Against Crimes Task Force. The Sheriff's Office uses ICAC as the acronym, the Continuation Program Proceeds, to fund one Sheriff's Office detective and one Wichita Police Department detective who are both dedicated to the ICAC investigative portion of the program. The Sheriff's Office and the Police Department supplement ICAC staffing with their own respective budgets and also have uh, supervisory personnel, other detectives, other investigators uh, that also work together to support ICAC operations. Kansas ICAC also works directly with the Sedgwick County Exploited and Missing Children's Unit. Together these units investigate all exploitation, missing human trafficking, physical and sexual abuse cases involving child victims. Uh, our Kansas ICAC office here locally uh, supports 39 other affiliate ICAC agencies across the state of Kansas. They serve uh, locally some 500 and almost 4,000 residents of the county and another uh, collectively altogether over 2.8 million residents throughout the state of Kansas. Uh, we've noticed that this uh, residential count, the number of people that we support through this, this program, has increased about 1.1% uh, over the last sentence, uh, census. Uh, the affiliate agencies that I spoke of across the state include other law enforcement agencies, both city, county, and tribal enforcement agencies. I would also mention that Kansas has over 8,000 registered sex offenders on their rolls. 15% of them live in the greater Wichita Sedgwick County area. Uh, ICAC also partners with state and federal prosecutors and other agencies to ensure proper prosecution of these cases that we are involved in. The state of Kansas has in increased in the number of identified domestic minor sex trafficking cases 
Uh, specifically here locally at our EMC unit, we have identified 61 victims and 49 suspects that are involved in domestic minor sex trafficking in the calendar year 2016. Year to date, only halfway through the year, we've identified 43 victims and 29 suspects, which is significantly higher at the halfway point than where we would have been for the same time, same period last year. The majority of these cases involve technology facilitated prostitution. Additionally, we've not only seen the advertisement of these crimes across the internet, uh, but the perpetrators also are utilizing a lot of social media to recruit victims. Cantus ICAC will continue to build relationships and list new task force affiliates and partners to combat the issue of child exploitation. Uh, again, I've brought before you for your consideration uh, this grant. Uh, a little bit of detail on the grant, it again, covers the funding, which actually is a little bit different than what we have seen in previous year. There was a, uh, a notification we received from the Department of Justice where they discontinued funding for about a three-month period, and they've went back now and picked that up in this new grant which will cover the, uh, the time period starting retroactively back to July 1st this year and through September 30th of next year. Uh, a portion of the funding that we're requesting your uh, consideration on will be passed through to the city of Wichita, which will be used to reimburse their police department for the costs associated with their personnel that fall under this agreement and this funding matter. Uh, I don't really have anything else to add to my presentations, but I would again respectfully request your consideration and subsequent approval and also stand for any questions you may have. Thank you, Colonel Powell. Commissioners, do you have any question or comment? Uh, I don't see anyone wishing to speak. Um, I would just make the comment that uh, I, I appreciate the intensive e effort with the resources we have to try to address this. Um, disease that we have in our community and it's regrettable that in our the culture of our country and even our local community that this uh, type of um, remedial and corrective action is necessary uh, to find perpetrators of crimes against children it um, you know it, it this boggles your mind it almost makes no sense how can that happen but it does and uh, so I appreciate your effort and this is also uh, when we were previously talked about cooperation with our counterparts uh, in the city of Wichita. Another good example of how we cooperate intensively together to try to address this uh, issue in our community. So uh, I want to also um, offer my thanks that you all are, are committed to that effort. Um, with that, commissioners, uh, what's the will of the board? I move we take the recommended action. Second. I have a motion and a second to take the recommended action regarding this grant. Uh, is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ranzaw? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Unruh? Aye. Thank you all. Thank you, Colonel. Next item. Item F, amendments to the Wichita Sedgwick County Comprehensive Plan. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Scott Knable with the Metropolitan Area Planning Department. Uh, I'm here to uh, bring you a uh, proposed amendment to uh, the uh, Wichita Sedgwick County Comprehensive Plan. Uh, <coughs> the Comprehensive Plan, uh, the Community Investments Plan, the current Comprehensive Plan was adopted in 2015. It contains a, uh, a strategy for annual monitoring, uh, lays out the uh, things that the Planning Department will uh, review. One of those is an annual discussion with uh, the, uh, the cities in Sedgwick County uh, regarding a uh, map that's contained in the, in the plan called the Urban Growth Areas Map. Uh, this map is a policy document. It's not, it's not prescriptive in the extent that it exists in the, in the Community Investments Plan. It makes a uh, designation for all of the cities so that they can work better together. Uh, those areas where each city is intending to extend uh, municipal services over the next 20 or so years uh, and where corporate uh, annexations uh, into those cities would occur. That 
map is also then tied through the zoning code to this urban area of influence with the which this commission established in 2015 provides for a method of uh, conversation and input into uh, requests for uh, zoning changes in uh, 2016 uh, this commission uh, expanded the uh, urban area of influence uh, in for the uh, city of Garden Plain from the, uh, I would say, golden color, the darker uh, color that's not gray, the gray is the current city limits, to the lighter tan color. Uh, that was an action uh, that was taken. What urban, what uh, Garden, or Garden Plain is requesting is that that urban area of influence also be their uh, urban growth area, which is what the zoning code states uh, the urban areas of influence should be, is the urban growth areas established by the comprehensive plan. So this uh, amendment of the comprehensive plan really is enacting something that the county commission has already approved uh, just in another document. Uh, the second uh, uh, <coughs> recommended change to this ur urban growth area map uh, actually involves uh, the elimination of a couple of areas of urban growth area for the city of Mount Hope, which are shown kind of in the brownish color on this map, uh, <clears throat> and then the addition of a small area at the south end of their uh, corporate limits uh, for future commercial and industrial growth. They're requesting this change because this, is, this matches their recently adopted comprehensive plan uh, and the area that their comprehensive plan covers. Uh, the uh, Planning Commission uh, recommended, voted to uh, recommend approval of uh, both of these uh, changes to the urban growth area map uh, and uh, recommend that you adopt a resolution uh, adop adopting this amendment to the uh, uh, comprehensive plan. And I'll stand for questions. All right. Thank you, Scott. Commissioners, are there any comment or questions? Uh, Commissioner Ranzoff. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question on the, uh, on the Mount Hope. If we approve this and the uh, growth area expands, what happens in the urban area of influence? The, the urban area of influence, according to the language of the zoning code, would automatically adjust to what this urban growth area is. So the, the two areas in brown, the one in the northeast and the one in the southwest, would be removed. The area in light tan at the very south end would be added. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comment or question? Seeing none, what's the will of the board? Uh, Commissioner Dennis. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, both of these uh, communities are in my district, uh, and uh, I served on the MAPC when we adopted the comprehensive plan, and it's designed to be a living document that changes with time. And so I recommend that uh, we adopt the resolution uh, amending the comprehensive plan, recommend the Metropolitan Area Planning as recommended by the Metropolitan Area Planning Committee. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will second. Um, we have a motion and a second. Commissioner Ranzon. In the past, I've been uh, opposed to expanding the urban area of influence. I believe it adds uh, a redundant and unnecessary bureaucracy to property owners in that area. Uh, I continue to be opposed with that, and my vote will reflect that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there any other comment? I see none, uh, so Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ranzaw? No. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Unruh? Aye. Uh, thank you, Scott. Next item, please. Item G, report of the Board of Bids and Contracts regular meeting on July 13, 2017. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Joe Thomas, Purchasing Director. The July 13th meeting of the Board of Bids and Contracts results in three items for your consideration. Item number one is for each of the hydrostatic drive side cast sweepers for fleet management. Uh, this recommendation is to accept the low proposal from Barry Tractor and Equipment in the amount of $199,864 and establish contract pricing for the labor, parts, and freight at the rates listed above for three years. Item number two three each of the tandem axle dump trucks with their attachments for fleet management. And this recommendation is to accept the low proposal from Roberts Truck Center of Kansas LLC doing business as Summit Truck Group in the amount of $538,617 
and also establish contract pricing for labor, parts, and freight at the rates listed for three years. Our final item, item number three, is patient transportation for various county departments. And this recommendation is to accept the overall low proposal from Apple Bus Company at the rates listed and establish contract pricing for one year with four one-year options to renew. I'll be happy to try answer any questions you may have, and I recommend approval of these items. All right, Joe, thank you. We do have a comment. Commissioner Ranzo. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, make a motion that we, report, that we approve the Board of Bids and Contracts with the exception of item two. Item two. So we can have further discussion on that. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the bid board recommendations with the exception of item two. Any any discussion on the motion? Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ranzaw? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Unruh? Aye. So now we have item two for discussion. Commissioner Ranzaw, would you like to make a comment? Well, I'll just say we're going to replace three dump trucks that are about five years old, <clears throat> have around $150,000. Uh, I ha had some questions with staff earlier. I, I asked for some maintenance information. I'm not sure I've received that yet. If I have, I've missed it in the email. But um, I have got some information as far as uh, the mileage, et cetera. I know. We, we looked at private sector uh, entities, and they're using the trucks for 250 to 300,000 miles, which is twice as long as, as what we're using. So I have some concerns about uh, going forward with this particular <coughs> item. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I noticed that Penny is here. Did you have a spe specific question for her on, on any of the information that you wanted? or? Uh, no, uh, Excuse me. Penny Pollen Fleet Management. Uh, the maintenance dollars were in that email that I sent yesterday. I have the year make and the miles and then the dollar amounts right after the miles. That would be unscheduled maintenance for the past five years. Okay, I thought that was uh, the amount we were going to get back from Purple Wave because we'd asked that amount as well. True. But, oh, so, so that's the amount there? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Donnell. <coughs> thank you. Uh, Penny, you might stay up there. Uh, I appreciate you getting back to me about the question about what does the private sector do. So historically, you were getting rid of dump trucks at around 100,000 miles. Is that correct? And we've pushed these to 150,000 miles? Correct. Well, actually, they were, I believe, before the directors before me, they were 100,000. They got pushed to 130,000. Okay. And then you've pushed it up to 150. No, um, these are just over the extended okay. the life mileage. Okay. Um, piggybacking on what Commissioner Ranzel said, so when you looked at the private sector companies and the two that had them here in town that responded to you, they both said they kept them between 250 and 300,000 miles. Yes, sir. What do you feel comfortable pushing these machines to? Like I told you, I just. I sold my car last month with 363,000 miles on it. So I know, I, I know that, and it sold in one day. Um, but, but I know cars and vehicles and, and things can go longer. Um, what type of a plan are we going to put in place to match what the private sector is doing? Because they're doing that without a fleet management system uh, as robust as ours. Some of them might have a fleet management company they work with, but we have staff on hand to take care of these machines. I would contend you do better with maintenance than most private companies do. So why can't we get closer to that, Penny? I don't know that we can't. I just do not have any historical data to back it up. I'm merely I'm following the uh, replacement policy. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I would like to do more research and perhaps keep one of the trucks to do a test and continue to use it and see how many more miles we can get out of it. Can, in, the, in this contract that we're, we would agree today, um, are we agreeing to sell these trucks in this contract if we approve it? No. Or will that come later? How, how, do, how can we use one of these trucks that you are going to potentially be selling on Purple Wave? How, how would we keep one in the system? 
Well, the two will go to Purple Wave. We'll just keep one at one of the yards and have one of them use it according to how they're using it now. I, I do not feel comfortable moving forward today with this unless I have assurance that we can do that. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, for, for my clarification, Commissioner, uh, unless we have assurance that we will keep one of the vehicles for yes. a test case? Yes. All right. Well, we can uh, include that in a motion if it comes to that point. But Commissioner Hell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't actually know what my colleagues were thinking uh, in some of the discussions <laughs> that may have happened. <clears throat> may have happened as they continue to think about this, but I, I, I had a discussion with Penny as well. <coughs> and uh, I also have concerns about, the, I guess what I would call the triggers to, uh, to make choices to sell these trucks and to buy new trucks. And just for my own information, to, or please remind me, how many of these trucks do we currently have in our fleet? We have 22. 22 trucks, okay. Um, you know, if we sell them on Purple Wave, they typically go for around 50000 Correct. 50000 So if we sold all three trucks, we get about $150,000. Um, and I see that these trucks, the unit cost is $179,000. And I guess as I continue to think about our discussion uh, about this, I think it would be, um, rather than using uh, triggers that have not been proven, uh, I guess I would... I would almost feel not. I almost feel better if we would use not just one truck, but all three trucks for our, our, our uh, test. And what I'd like to do potentially is just. Uh, <clears throat> I'll probably make a motion in just a minute to approve two of the three, if that's uh, acceptable to do so, and keep three trucks parked at different yards. Let them park the new trucks. Some, some are trying not to use the new ones. Uh, continue to use the old trucks as much as possible as, as as they have been in the past. And should we have uh, a breakdown? We have a backup vehicle. So we're not going to be in a situation where we can't provide the work or a service because of a lack of a vehicle, because we did buy two of the three. They're not all three going to break at one time. <clears throat> and that would allow us to get some data regarding how many miles these can, these can go, what kind of breakdowns would happen. I mean, the worst things probably would be something like a, a transmission or an engine would fail. Um, that My guess is probably 100,000 miles more on these trucks before that something like that would happen. And even if it did happen, these, these trucks still have value. They can still be repaired. Um, so we would basically forego $150,000 of, of revenue at this time. We would get data that's very, very, uh, very valuable. Because I think our entire our tire, um, uh, program needs to be, uh, I guess, challenged and, and based on data rather than someone's ideas. We have not ac actually ever done a study like this. And so I, I do know we have different kinds of trucks we have. Uh, different manufacturers, and I know they, they may perform differently, but I guess getting some data would be very helpful. Um, and if these tr three trucks are all the same, that would be uh, less ideal. If they're different than each other, that would be better. Um, but I guess I would like to, to, to make a motion that we would approve two of the three vehicles. Uh, and along with that, I'd like to see us keep three vehicles and continue to use those as primary, uh, mm -hmm. primary vehicles and try to, to, to not use the newer vehicles uh, so that we can get data on them and then based on on what happens in the future we can continue to re refine and, and hone our policy to uh, something that, as actually as, as efficient as possible because I think what's going to end up happening is we will sell these vehicles and we will see uh, somebody in the private sector will it will probably buy them for fifty thousand dollars and drive them another hundred and fifty thousand miles at least I, I have no doubt that's likely to happen so uh, <clears throat> to, to clarify my motion I'd like to make a motion we would purchase two of the three vehicles and we would uh, retain these three vehicles for a study to uh, define our uh, policy uh, with data on based on what happens down the road. Um, I'll second. All right, thank you. I think that's all my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, <coughs> may, may I ask a question for clarification? We're going to buy two as backups. Is that the intent? Well, Mr. Chairman, the, the concern was <coughs> they said if we didn't, excuse me, for the frog in my throat. If we didn't buy any vehicles at all, that they felt like it would be, it would put us in a situation where we, we may not be able to rely on these vehicles to actually uh, make all of our commitments in terms of maintenance and work that has to be done around the mm -hmm. county. If one was to break, it would, it would cause a, a burden potentially on, on our public works. They would not have the ability to do their job. And uh, so to that extent, I, I think that the, the point is I would like to, uh, um, it's about the same amount of money 
uh, we would forego $150,000 in revenue at this time, but not spend $179,000 at this time. So it's, a, it's a roughly equivalent. And that let, lets us do the greatest amount of study possible on three vehicles. It also prepares us to do the work, if necessary, on vehicles that are dependable and, and roadworthy, should these three vehicles prove to be a problem. Again, the, the, the theory is these are not going to be trustworthy vehicles. And to that extent, if they do break down, they don't break down somewhere in Sedgwick County, uh, all they have to do is get on the radio or cell phone call, get a ride back to another vehicle, and we can deal with that in terms of a tow and a repair as a, as a side issue. It will not cause undue burden to the county to, to keep these vehicles and let that study happen. Um, and this was a big discussion at the state level. Some of the people at the state level were driving across the state of Kansas, and, and some of these people are traveling are very vulnerable uh, people, and they're far away from home, and they break down. It'd be a, a great concern. That's not really true in this case. They're going to be within our county. Uh, we have a standby vehicle ready to go. I think we, if we do this, mo do what I've asked for in this motion. And so again, my my motion would be based on the fact that uh, I try to get the most amount of data out of these three vehicles and not cause an undue burden to a public works by not having vehicles ready to go should they actually break down as I guess is possible. So I uh, hope that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that uh, explanation, Commissioner. Commissioner Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I got a question for Joe. Uh, the contract uh, that you, or the bid that you put out was for three vehicles, and so whoever was bidding on that uh, bid on the fact that they were going to have a contract to procure three vehicles and sell them to us. So their pricing is based on that. Yes, uh, sir. If we cut it back to two, what's that do to that? It, it would be at the discretion of the vendor. We would contact them and, and let them know the will of the commission and ask them if it would be okay to proceed with the same pricing. That's what we'd like to do. But it would be at the decision of the vendor. So what we don't know right now is what the impact of that would be because our next bid was like one hundred eighty. $185,000 per vehicle. Right. Uh, so it could end up costing us more uh, by not purchasing that third vehicle. That is a possibility. Okay. Uh, that pre presents a little bit of uncertainty to me that, uh, that I'm concerned about, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not really different than uh, the comments that have been made from uh, several of the other commissioners uh, on this. Uh, and uh, Penny will tell you that I was concerned uh, when she came in and briefed me, uh, and actually Commissioner Ranzo was with us when we were briefed on this. Uh, I spent a lot of my life in logistics, and uh, I'm not going to second guess you uh, on this by any means, but uh, these are Peterbilt trucks, and, and if you take a look at this truck, uh, these things are designed to go a long ways. Uh, 130, 150,000 miles, uh, they're just starting to get warmed up. Uh, I, I, I am not convinced that, uh, that we're doing the best thing that we can do at 130,000 miles on a great big Peterbilt truck. What's that thing turn over to zero at? What's the odometer? Is it a million miles or it goes back to zero? I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I, I would bet that it's a million miles <laughs> before it goes to zero. Uh, so I, I really think that, that there's data out there. There was a comment made that maybe we ought to keep a couple of these to develop our own data. I, I can't believe uh, that as large as the United States is uh, and as many people that are running fleets of trucks that there is not data out there that can tell you how long that a Peterbilt truck uh, is going to be able to run before that you're going to need to start thinking about uh, the replacement in a major fleet. Major fleet is completely different than somebody who's got one or two trucks. Uh, uh, we've got people out there uh, that are running major fleets of trucks that's got hundreds of them. So that there, there's data out there already. So uh, maintaining these trucks to try and get our own data on two, truck, two trucks, I don't know if it's going to be a valid test of, of what it takes. Uh, you, you really need a big fleet and a number of big fleets across the country in order to be able to decide wh what the mileage needs to be, uh, what the usage needs to be, and it's not just mileage on these trucks. Uh, there's an hour meter on these things too, I'm certain, uh, that tell how long that that engine has been running. So it's, it's uh, not only miles, it's also hours. Uh, so coming in telling me how many miles it's got on it and it's time to replace it, uh, if this truck is used to, uh, for certain tasks that require high engine hours, I mean, it could be time to replace it, but I can't tell. 
uh, because we're not even using that as a metric. Uh, so I'm not sure that I'll support the motion as it is because I don't know that keeping two trucks is valuable to us. If we're going to buy some new trucks, we might as well recover some of the cost uh, for the taxpayers of the ones we've got right now. Uh, but in the future, uh, I'm probably not going to be as, as uh, amiable <laughs> to uh, uh, accepting what you're telling me unless we've got some strict data that tells us this is where uh, actually we need to develop a policy. This is where we need to replace these vehicles based on mileage and hours on the vehicle. Or if there's significant damage to it, you know, if somebody runs it off the road, obviously we're going to probably have to replace it. But, but I, I don't know that we've got a good policy right now that based on mileage and hours. Uh, uh, and I don't think that keeping two trucks is going to be valuable to us. I don't think we'll get the data that we need. Uh, and I appreciate the, the other commissioners talking about trying to do this to, to gather the data, but I think there's a better way of doing it than trying to maintain a couple trucks that may or may not uh, prove out what we need to know. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, our county engineer, may, may I ask you for a comment on this discussion? <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. David Spears, Assistant County Manager for Public Works. Uh, just want to say, uh, I'm not sure I understood Commissioner Howell exactly, but if you keep, say you kept the three trucks to study them and you <laughs> bought two more, but you bought two trucks, that is called an addition to the fleet. So we would have to have a resolution. So in instead of having 22 trucks, we'd have 24 trucks. The other thing is we pay rental, uh, type of rental. We pay budget. We pay money into fleet for every truck every month so that when the fund builds up, we can replace those trucks. So it's there's a few more complications here than what you, meets the eye. The other thing I want to say is so you can take these uh, Peterbilt trucks and study them, but who's to say on the next bid that comes in if it's going to be a Peterbilt truck that's low? It could be a Ford truck. could be a, any other kind of truck. So you're really only studying this. And I really think there's got to be data out in the field about studies like this. But, I mean, it, it can be done what you want to do. And I know Penny is following the policy as it is now. And if you want to change the policy, uh, I'm sure she'll follow it then, and so will we. You just have to remember when a truck is down, I mean, that affects us as far as getting our work done. And trucks are a premium thing with us. It's one of the bigger, they're, they're always busy. They're always hauling something in one yard or another needs trucks. We have even a truck foreman who delegates out the trucks at different places depending on what's going on. We might have some coal mix going on, might be needing to. Uh, send some gravel or some rock somewhere. So, just we will live with whatever you decide to do. But I'm gonna, I, I just wanted to throw that all into the mix there. It, it, it says it can get you're going to add to the fleet if you buy some but don't trade in the others. Thank, thank you, Mr. Spears. And that's um, one of the comments I was going to make that uh, do we does this violating policy if we just start adding vehicles? But um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out now whether I think it's better to uh, not buy any of these and just keep using these and collect the data and then if we see that we've got to make a change we'll have to make a change but we have commissioners here that want to speak and I'll try to go with uh, folks who hadn't spoken recently Commissioner Ranzo thank you a couple questions uh, when how long do we have to make a decision on this particular bid this was treated as a, a proposal, according to the record, would be 120 days. Okay. Um, and as far as those uh, maintenance costs, I'd like to have each of those itemized out as well. Okay. okay. How would you like them sorted? You want them itemized out by? By truck. I mean, I mean, you have a total amount. I have a total for each truck. Right. Do you have? Can you? I, I, itemize that out as far as what the repairs were that added up to that? I can, yes. Okay. And just to give some history, I, I believe it was 2011 when we revisited this policy. Um, we had some data back then. Uh, and I, I, my understanding was we, did, we, we had some data. Like you said, we, the policy was 100,000. I thought the data then said that we could go further than what we actually did. 
um, on perhaps dump trucks, some others. I, and my memory could be failing me, but I'm going to go back and check. I, I remember having that discussion. We made some leadway, but we didn't go for some reason. We couldn't get enough votes to extend it out as far as what we thought the data showed. Um, you know how things work kind of sometimes, but uh, I'm confident that uh, this is too soon for these particular vehicles given this data, the history. Uh, so I'm not prepared to support purchasing any trucks uh, at this time, even though I understand the intent. I think we have 22 trucks. There should be data on fleets out there. We have 22 trucks. The more you have, you can keep all that data, and I'm just, I'm just, the, pri the fact that the private sector has incentive to do things in a cost-effective manner, and they're using them twice as long as what we are. That means we could be spending half the amount of money over time on, on these particular type of trucks, and I, 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 that's where I'm at today. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Donnell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, make a substitute motion um, that we delay decision on this until we gather more information like uh, Commissioner Dennis was talking about um, there has to be data um, national data that that we can get before we make this um, decision so that that'd be my motion to delay second okay we have a substitute motion and second um, is that all Commissioner? that's all sir okay can I make a comment yes please one of the reasons that we have the replacement policy is so that you can forecast your budget operational and your vehicle equipment replacement. One thing I would like to add, although I don't have historical data to give you, in the past 25 years since I've been at Fleet, they have reduced, we've reduced technicians by five in the heavy equipment shop because we have improved the average vehicle equipment age. So there was more maintenance because the equipment was older. So we've reduced our staff by five because the equipment has, we, they're newer, they're working, they're more efficient. Thank you. That's uh, important information. Appreciate it. Commissioner Howell. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just for clarity on the motion, is this a motion to table this decision for, we have some time to, to, to think about this and get some more data. So this is a motion to table this item for a little while and bring it back up if we need to? Yes. Okay. Uh, I understand that. I, I, I'm glad to support that. I would just simply just make a couple of comments based on uh, uh, Commissioner Dennis uh, made made some point uh, uh, a couple of points here about the money. But let me just let me just ask uh, make make a point that we have four million dollars worth of vehicles. You take 22 times this cost, it's roughly four million dollars worth of vehicles that we're replacing roughly every five years. Um, if we if we again these these are roughly five years old, maybe that's not typical. So I heard that Commissioner Ranzai said that it's not true. She's giving me some head nods back there. I'd have to do some more research to validate that number. Okay. I don't believe we're buying $4 million. Okay. Well, in anyway, trucks. 22 trucks times that unit cost is roughly $4 million. And uh, if, we, if we did not accept this bid today and we had to change the bid to the more expensive bid, there's three other bids on the sheet about the same price, 185 That's $10,000 more. Uh, I'm sorry, $5,000 more per vehicle. But we're spending $36,000 a year on, the, on, on renting these vehicles. And so if we were able to extend a vehicle by a year, we would save, comparing those two things, $30,000. I think we, we, would be, uh, we ought to be eager to get this data. And I'm not sure what the data is based on right now. When I've asked you the question in my office, we didn't really have books. We, look, we, didn't look, we weren't looking at books trying to figure out you know, where the national standards were for these trucks. It's just more of like, here's what we do, normally do in Sedgwick County. You know, it was really based on any data that I could, I could put my thumb on. And so whether it be hours on the engine or, or miles driven um, or age, uh, those are, we're using some certain triggers right now, but I'm not sure that those triggers are correct. If we were able to extend the life of these vehicles by a year, it would be absolutely worth the, the, the effort to get there. And by the way, if we didn't make a purchase of, of two vehicles today, and I understand there's some complications with that, I get that, I think those could be resolved. Uh, but nevertheless, if we make the purchase today, there's gonna be a short time, we would have more than 22 vehicles. We would receive the new ones. We would sell the old ones. So uh, obviously we can keep more than 22 for at least a for, for a time while they're, before they go to auction. So that's obviously something we, we obviously would do. But I, th I think those complications could be, re could be resolved. I think that the, uh, the likely outcome of this, hopefully, my opinion is, is, is we ought to develop this, this uh, uh, 
data collection, try to get that data on these three vehicles. I hate to see this see us give these up. And my, my opinion is if we're not going to purchase these vehicles today, I'm not sure we're going to come back to this and visit this at any time in the future. I think keeping these three vehicles to get that data is probably the most important thing we have to decide on. And uh, so to me, that's the buying two vehicles, in my opinion, was a way for us to be sensitive to the, the needs of public works. If we're not willing to do that today, I'm not sure we come back to this in the future, but I think keeping the three vehicles is absolutely critically important. We have got to get that data. And if there's data available nationally, that should have been presented to us pre uh, previously. Um, I, I asked the question earlier and was not able to get the answer. So um, I'll support the, su the substitute motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think we're about ready to vote, uh, but I want to let you know that uh, I do support the substitute motion. Uh, I, I wouldn't have supported the original motion that was made because I think now we're trying to make policy from the bench on the fly, and I don't think that that's a good way of, of making policy. Uh, so I, I think we've got a little bit of time. Uh, we can go back and take a look at the policy and make a wise decision, and we can move forward. So I'll vote in favor of the substitute motion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Manager, did you want to make a comment on yep, this discussion? Please, uh, uh, Chairman. I'd like to just uh, <coughs> like that opportunity. I think it, it's more than kind of just dump trucks. It kind of goes and transcends to the entire major equipment fleet um, policy decision because what aff affects this decision is the same thing that affects fire trucks or tractors or whatever that is. So I'd like the, the ability to take this back and, and let me analyze this and let the staff chew on it. And then we come back to you with, with probably an update to our major equipment life cycle, life cycle process in, in policy and bring that back to you. So we owe you that. Um, that's my recommendation. All right, thank you, Mr. Manager. So as I understand it, the substitute motion is, is that we just defer this. Is that correct? All right. Now, um, we would, we're assuming that we'll get some information back before this bid expires so that we can still capture this bid. Uh, and, we, and you said we had 120 days. And I wanted to clarify, it's 120 days from the date of the bid o a proposal opening, which was May 30th, so we have until September 30th. That okay. give us the four months. All right. Just to give good. you the accurate timeline. Well, I don't want to don't want to lose what we have, but I want to make a good decision, and I think this will allow us that opportunity. So, commissioners, is there any other uh, comment on a motion to defer? <clears throat> Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ranzaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. Thank, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Commissioners. We, we all understand and have our marching orders, I guess, so we can we'll do that. Um, next item, please. Consent <laughs> agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my, my Skulls County Manager, recommend you approve consent agenda items, hotel through Romeo. Okay, Commissioner Renzel. Mr. Chairman, I move we uh, approve the consent agenda with the exception of item L, which I'd like to have. I have a few questions on. Second. Second. We have a second from Commissioner Dennis. Um, Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ranzaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. And now item L, Commissioner Ranzaw, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, I have some questions. I... All right, you're going to help me out? I'm going to try, Commissioner. Okay, first of all, I, I think I know what this is for what areas are using this but tell me what areas we are using this for and I noticed that um, in 2016 we got $150,000 and 2017 it says at 40% 63,000 tell me what that what why you're saying at 40% has something changed about this I guess that's what I'm interested in finding out good morning um, Commissioner Steve Stonehouse with the Division of Corrections at 40% of the year. At 40% okay. of the year, they had, we have collected $63,384. Okay, so you... So that's what that... You means. expect to get close to the same amount. Okay. Yes, yes sir. So these are um, in our juvenile facilities, in the juvenile detention facility and juvenile residential facility, we operate kitchens to feed the residents. And these are um, reimbursed meals for breakfast, lunch, and snacks 
if we follow the guidelines as put forth by Kansas Department of Education. Well, and that was the – I'd had some discussion in the past with Mark Masterson about this program. As I know there's a lot of requirements yes, for this, and – requirements that he'd like to would have liked to eliminate and so the question is is the amount we're getting back cost effective as far as all the time and if we, we we put into and i think at that time he thought it was but when i saw this 40 percent 63,000, i thought maybe they were now re reimbursing that a lower amount we're bringing a lot less that maybe it would be closer to where it wouldn't be cost effective anymore to you know, because of the time. I, I know there's lots of things. Right. There, there are there are requirements such as content of the meals and um, some of the food that we have to purchase. There's requirements of, of the vendors have to be by American first. And if, if something gets slipped in from another country, then that gets a bit messy. But we've got it pretty much down to a science now about how we, how we do our ordering with our vendor. But um, we are monitored. We have audits by KSDE as far as the food goes. Um, our reimbursements are going down because our population is going down. And we just reimburse about by actual meals served. So right. there's a lot of documentation yes, sir. that goes along. That's really why I kind of all the time it takes to keep track of everything and all the requirements you have to do beyond just getting the food and <laughs> right you know serving it so i i I'm, i'll make the assumption that we still feel like the amount of money we're getting back still compensates us enough for the extra work that we have to do but if we ever get to that point that we think it's not then please right. let us know and then that may for, you know and we do consider that every year when we go through this through this process because it is it's arduous and um we still feel like it's worthwhile. All right. Um, but well, like I said, basically it was this forty percent. I wanted to make sure, clarify, and I hadn't had time to talk to anyone beforehand. Sure. So I'll be su be supportive, and I'll make the motion that we approve the item. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second to approve to approve item L of the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ranzaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. Next item. Legislative issues. I think we have nothing to discuss today. Is that correct? All right. Um, and I know, commissioners, we have a fire district meeting that we need to take. So at this time, I will recess the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners and call to order the, the uh, Board of County Commissioners setting as a governing body of fire district number one. Um, Madam Clerk, first item. Roll call. Commissioner Dennis. Present. Commissioner Ranzaw? Present. Commissioner Howell? Present. Commissioner O'Donnell? Present. Chairman Unruh? Present. Uh, first item, please. Public agenda. I don't, haven't had anyone sign up to speak in the fire district uh, agenda, so next item, please. New business, item A, public hearing regarding the 2018 fire district number one budget. Commissioners, Mike Scholes, county manager. To, as indicated, today's the first public hearing on the 2018 fire district budget uh, the public publication you filed last week uh, was included a budget of seventeen million nine hundred fifty seven thousand six hundred ninety six and an ad valorem property tax levy of sixteen million four hundred fifty eight thousand five hundred and seventy one dollars which is approximately equivalent to eighteen point four one four mills based on the estimated assessed valuation and subject to technical adjustments. With that, I push it back to you for the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Um, Commissioner, before we open the public hearing, are there any comments or questions from the commissioners? Seeing none at this time, I will open the public hearing and ask for public input comment on the fire district budget. I see no one rising to speak, and mainly the usual suspects are in the audience here. So no one rising to speak. That being the case, we will close the public hearing. And um, with no vote or no declaration, so the meeting is closed um, for the record. Um, is there anything else to come before the fire district? Nothing. So therefore, we will adjourn fire district number one meeting and call back to order the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners from July 19. And um, 
At this time, I believe we are ready for other. Commissioners, is there any other comments that you'd like to make during this portion of the meeting? Commissioner Ranzall. I just want to give a quick update uh, as far as uh, an issue I've been working with uh, Judge Riddell's Boys Ranch and Lake Afton as far as the encumbrance. We'd originally been told by the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks that they would, that uh, the JRBR facilities should not have been included in the boundary. And now I believe that, and they were going to do the paperwork. Now I believe that's been stopped, but I haven't been able to get a straight answer from them as to who's made that decision up the chain. I will continue to try and find out. I think it may have been at the federal level. Uh, I'm a little confused as to why I can't get a direct answer to that. Um, but I'll continue to, I know the chairman will want me to continue to be persistent in this endeavor, and so I'll do so. Uh, I just want a straight answer so that I can tell the people, you know, why we're not doing this. Uh, we had a wonderful solution, or at least it would have been a wonderful, regardless of what we would have done anyway, we had a step in the right direction. Now that's being stopped. I just want to know why and or who, who did it so I can talk to the right person. I don't think that's too much to ask. Um, nor do I. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, is that all? That's all. Thank okay. You. Commissioner Howell, I believe you were next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to uh, congratulate um, Brigadier General Albert Miller on his promotion yesterday. And uh, he is in the process of uh, leaving the 22nd Air Refueling Wing at McConnell Air Force Base. He's uh, served with honor. He's a tremendous individual. He's been totally engaged in, this, in, the, in our community. Uh, everyone has been seeing him around the community. He's uh, very engaged. Um, three of us, as Commissioner Dennis, Commissioner Unruh, and myself, did attend that ceremony yesterday where the changing of command happened between, uh, at that time, was Colonel Miller and was handed over to Colonel Olson. I want to congratulate him as well. Um, I don't know how old Colonel Olson is, but he is uh, uh, obviously uh, one that's very fast moving in his career uh, to take command of McConnell Air Force Base. He's uh, done a tremendous job in advancing his career. I think he'll be a four star before he's done. But uh, Colonel Olson, I think, is going to be great for our community. I'm looking forward to get to know him a little bit, and I got to meet his family yesterday. I just wanted to congratulate both of those uh, gentlemen for uh, uh, for their respective positions in our community, McConnell Air Force Base, which we we, do, we depend on them so much in our community, and of course it's in my district. And so I just wanted to to make that point that uh, that General Miller is on his way out. I want to thank him for his service and uh, welcome Colonel Olson uh, to the lead position as command of the 22nd Air Refueling Wing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, today at noon, we are dedicating the Meridian Street project. Uh, I'll be joining uh, Councilmember Jeff Bluebaugh at uh, the corner of Harry and Meridian. Um, it's a, like I mentioned last week, it's a project that's been going on almost six years that I initiated when I was on the Wichita City Council. So I'm very proud of it. Um, it was very necessary and it's a beautiful street. If, uh, everyone hasn't had the opportunity to get down uh, on Meridian, but most importantly, aside from the street being nice and not patchworked, um, the flooding issue has been resolved, and uh, that was the major, major source of frustration for many of the residents in South Wichita. So uh, it, it's a good milestone for the city of Wichita, and I'm excited to be there today. So thank Very you, good. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I just comment that uh, last weekend on Saturday, uh, my wife and I were able to go down and, and bring greetings uh, to the Wichita Sedgwick County Historical Museum and the folks that were there for an opening of an exhibit that um, was really quite fascinating and interesting for those of you that aren't familiar with that. Uh, Sedgwick County has been an um, annual funder of the museum and we gave special uh, funds to get this exhibit started that they opened. Um, I think we made that decision back in 2014, but it is a refurbishing of the original mayor's office in that historic building. But it's um, a fascinating place to visit. There's a lot of artifacts and pictures um, that take you back to the beginning of the city of Wichita and Sedgwick County, and uh, it's, it's worth your visit. It's really an interesting building. So, um, folks, or commissioners, with that, um, I don't see anyone else asking to speak, and I think we have no more items on the agenda and no executive session. 
That being the case, um, we will stand adjourned.